Dear ladies and gentlemen, um, good morning. Um, and first of all, let me share you uh, my greatest pleasure uh, to be here at uh, this uh, conference and uh, give a presentation. Um, as my fields of research uh, cover international criminal law and international human rights law, um, I can tell you I'm thrilled to bits uh, to give uh, this lecture uh, to um, emergency aspects of the ECHR system with special regard uh, to the assessment of the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. Okay, um, I'm going to start off by outlining some antecedents uh, of my encounter with this topic. Uh, in early 2020, uh, when we were only shocked outside listeners to the news on a remote raging epidemic in China, we started a comprehensive research on public emergency, or with the Hungarian term special legal order, in the Ferenc Madl Institute. Surprisingly, the incentive of this research project had nothing to do with the COVID-19 health crisis initially. The reason for beginning this research was the imminent Ninth Amendment of the Fundamental Law of Hungary that aimed to simplify and add extra guarantees to the constitutional provisions on special legal order. Soon afterwards, it turned out that the research speedily became more relevant than it had meant to be and state of danger was officially declared in Hungary on the 11th March 2020. Around that time, several European countries introduced exceptional measures to handle the public health emergency of international concern as the World Health Organization qualified the new pandemic. Within the framework of this research, I was in charge of examining the international human rights aspects of public emergency with special regard to the ECHR. And frankly speaking, I was absolutely astonished to find out that although 46, before the withdrawal of Russia, 47, European countries are states, parties to the convention, only 10 of them notified the Secretary General of the Council of Europe based on Article 15 in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. I wondered what the reason could be uh, for this kind of avoidance on the side of state parties and why is Article 15 an outcast? At this point, perhaps I should explain the distinction between the limitation of human rights and the derogation from human rights as multiple human rights instruments apply this double terminology. On the one hand, they stipulate peacetime limitations as a manifestation of the non-absolute nature of human rights and of the sensitive balance between the interest of the individual and of the public. As for the ECHR, the scope of these limitations is specified in the text of the Convention and determined by its interpretation by state parties as well as by the ECTHR. In line with this, limitations can be permanent. The ECHR allows substantial scope for state parties to respond to a crisis or emergency by limiting specific rights rather than derogating from them. On the other hand, multiple human rights instruments also provide for a possibility of derogating and no equal sign can be put between limitation and derogation. The right to derogation means that state parties to the ECHR have a temporary opportunity in time of emergency to exempt from their international legal obligations. Accordingly, a derogation of a right or an aspect of a right means its complete 
or partial elimination as an international obligation and the primary consequence of a lawful invocation of Article 15 is that the derogating state may not be held responsible for the violation of the concerned provisions of the ECHR. Rather than there being hard and fast boundaries between limitations and derogations, there tends to be an overlap with similar principles being applicable, like the principle of proportionality or the principle of non-discrimination. Well, um, here goes the full text of Article 15, and I think it um, seems a bit uh, overcrowded article at the first glance, doesn't it? Um, okay, uh, so maybe we should take uh, its paragraphs uh, one at a time. But um, above all, let me tell you briefly why this article is so packed. Now, let's take a moment to reflect on concluding treaties at international diplomatic conferences. Accepting the final draft of a treaty will never be a walk in the park. It's not easy as pie. Additionally, in the case of derogation clauses, the text of the provisions may neither be too extensive to give chance to states' abuses, nor too restrictive to prevent reasonable scenarios, wars, terrorism, natural disasters, industrial accidents, mass demonstrations, pandemics, and so on, from resulting in officially declared public emergency. Therefore, the concept of public emergency needs to establish a delicate balance between the rule of law and the lack of forcibility. This is what you see on the slide. It is noteworthy that to date, beyond COVID-19 derogations, only eight other states parties to the ECHR, Albania, Armenia, France, Georgia, Greece, Ireland, Turkey and the UK have relied on their right to derogation. When discussing Article 15, I think there are five main issues here. As it was explicitly formulated in Lawless versus Ireland in 1961, the application of the derogation clause shall meet four substantive and one procedural criteria. First, the right to derogate can be invoked only in time of war or other public emergency threatening the life of the nation. Second, a state party to the convention may take measures derogating from its obligations under the ECHR only to the extent strictly required by the exigencies of the situation. Third, any derogation may not be inconsistent with the state's other obligations under international law. Fourth, certain rights under the ECHR do not allow any derogation. And fifth, as far as the procedural criterion is concerned, the state party to the convention availing itself of this right of derogation shall keep the Secretary General of the Council of Europe fully informed. Due to inherent limits of this presentation in time, I'm going to cover only the first and the second aspects of the definition in my lecture. First and foremost, I should devote some time to address the question what can constitute war or public emergency. Although the court has never been required to interpret the concept of war, any substantial violence or uh, unrest short of war is likely to fall within the scope of a public emergency. In Greece versus the United Kingdom in 1958, the very first case concerning Article 15, 
The British government invoked public emergency on the territory of Cyprus, then part of its empire, and this public emergency was disputed by Greece. The European Commission of Human Rights argued that the government concerned retains, within certain limits, its discretion in appreciating the threat to the life of the nation. A discretion which it had, however, to be subjected to critical European supervision. The customary meaning of public emergency was formulated in a lawless versus Ireland as an exceptional situation or crisis or emergency which affects the whole population and constitutes a threat to the organized life of the community of which the state is composed. What should an emergency be like? It was clarified by the European Commission of Human Rights in the Greek case as well that an emergency should be actual and imminent at the same time we had better bear in mind that under international law public emergency of a preventative nature is not justified. Moreover, it was also formulated in the Greek case that an emergency must be exceptional in that the normal measures permitted by the ECHR for the maintenance of public safety, health and order are plainly not adequate anymore. The term of strictly required suggests a test more demanding than necessity under other articles of the Convention, which requires that the state shows a pressing social need for its measures of limitation. Although in the European approach, nation states are left a margin of appreciation to interpret and apply the rights and doctrines incorporated in the Convention, the special position on Article 15 of the ECHR is illustrated by the fact that it does not speak of measures which are necessary but holds that they must be strictly required. It was formulated in Ireland versus the United Kingdom that the limits on the court's powers of review are particularly apparent where Article 15 of the ECHR is concerned, nonetheless, states do not enjoy an unlimited freedom in this respect. When assessing the latter in Brennigan and McBride versus the United Kingdom, the court gave appropriate weight to factors as the nature of the rights affected by the derogation, the circumstances leading to and the duration of the emergency. In Bas versus Turkey, a recent judgment delivered in 2020, the ECTHR also addressed considerations giving rise to the application of Article 15 gradually becomes less forceful and relevant as the public emergency threatening the life of the nation while still persisting, declines in intensity, so the court put that the exigency criterion must be applied more stringently with the passage of time. Finally, we are going to focus briefly on recent applications reaching the ECTHR relating to the COVID-19 health crisis. These cases raise questions under a number of provisions of the Convention, like the right to life, the prohibition of torture, the right to liberty and security, the right to a fair trial, and so on. At this point, we also need to consider the lack of Article 15 cases in terms of COVID-19. This kind of shortage would allow us to presume two reasons. First, 
the relatively small number of Article 15 derogations related to the pandemic, and second, the relatively short period of time these derogations were in effect. So, how to sum my presentation up? Here, at a glance, are the main issues I have dealt with. First, considering the relevant case law, the number of Article 15 derogations and cases have been small compared to other articles of the Convention. Second, States' parties to the ECHR usually find quite enough flexibility in the Convention standards to accommodate any exceptional measures for public emergency purposes, and thanks to this leeway, they simply apply peacetime limitations instead of invoking Article 15 even in the time of public emergency. Due to this leeway, Governments would rather limit than derogate, especially in cases of internal disorder when there is a risk that the government's opponents will use the emergency derogation as evidence of the effectiveness of their campaign against the authorities. Third, there are four substantial and one procedural criteria of relying on Article 15. When declaring a public emergency, uh, state parties enjoy wide margin of appreciation, but not unlimited, as being under the scope of an ECTHR supervision. Fourth, the ECTHR has a very sensitive role in Article 15 cases, since any review by the court gives necessarily green light to criticisms that it re-evaluates crisis de decisions made by governments with the comfort of a hindsight. And last but not least, fifths, even though the high number of public emergencies declared throughout the member states of the Council of Europe, there was no Article 15 applications before the court. Well, um, dear ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to the end of my presentation. So there is nothing left but to say thank you for your kind attention and any questions or remarks are welcome.